This is the Get A Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. This is a continuation and part two from episode 107 with our anonymous One School Global Teacher. Um, the kids would talk about drinking. So I remember, um, you know, one of the things is the school goes from year three to the end of high school and often you will teach across uh, depending, you know, sometimes you might teach a primary class or whatever. Uh, you certainly, the kids are right there, so you're exposed to the primary kids. The primary kids would talk about drinking, as in they'd make little references. And the thing is, you know, with kids, those are the red flags. When a child discusses something which is developmentally not within their range, that's a red flag. So, kids and how who- young do you think that would be that they would be discussing that? Well, I was aware that they would have, I think, is it Sherry at the meetings from yeah, very old, like the yeah. year three, yeah. those kids were. Mm-hmm. And they would always come to Monday. It was like you would know the kids would be super tired because they've had this huge weekend. I remember yeah. a particular kid referring to partying and he was in primary school, so maybe year four, year five. But in terms of actual alcohol on campus, there, I remember an incident where we had like, you know, an end of term celebration. So a day where the kids were not doing normal school activities and leading up to it, they had, we had a day where for whatever reason, teachers were on campus, kids weren't on campus, but some of them were there rehearsing. And it was very clear that one of the students was going out to his mum's car with all of his friends doing something out there regularly like they were going out to the car park coming back in and as the day progressed he became more and more very clearly intoxicated and there was another time where there was an event and the kids were I mean I you know growing up in Australia that joke of having a party um, and someone's got a, a drink of some sort and they fall and the one thing they do is make sure that their drink doesn't spill I remember the kids having cans of, that's another thing, at a a normal school, particularly a primary school, you wouldn't see kids being served soft drink so openly. They love soft drinks, so the kids would be plied with sugary drinks. Um, But these kids running around or moving around with cans of the whole time, a can in their hand, Um, and then there was an incident where the boys left the campus, so they disappeared, Because I had been able to form enough of a relationship with the kids that they didn't feel the need to be so secretive, um, they told me that the boys had left. So I reported that to leadership because clearly you can't have kids off campus. It's not safe. They eventually turned back up. They were called into um, the office of the principal where they were so intoxicated that that leader was, um, and you know, the here here in here in lies the problem with the school. I remember the leader expressing that they could barely stand and that she was worried that one of them was going to vomit. Nothing came from that. So it was like, oh, we don't have any proof that they were drinking. I mean, it was very obvious that they were. Uh, another time I remember that, that, that kids were bringing alcohol on campus, they got caught and got an internal suspension, which involved uh, spending their time at the primary school, which is just like another part of the building where they were almost like heroes because everyone just thought it was hilarious that they'd done this thing. No yeah. It's it. kind of applauded. It was the same thing with my high yeah. school, the kids that would sneak off and he looked like an adult because he had managed, you know, he was shaving already kind of thing. Yeah. So he used to go and buy the alcohol at lunch and the kids would, yeah, they, and every time yeah. they were caught, they were like applauded. It was like, uh-huh, yeah. let's try and do it again. There, there was another campus where the, the kid that um, got up and left my class um, was known to have a really big problem in that he arrived to school intoxicated every day. He was hiding alcohol on campus at school. Um, I mean, it's so devastating because... What has led them to that point? You know, how how I... are they going to have any kind of a decent future? We know that alcohol is inherently linked to domestic abuse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but and then it, my question know, is why, like, it. what harm had that kid suffered to to be in that position? Like, I know yeah. that I was heavily addicted to, well, not 
addicted, but I was, I would have been down that path. I was heavily, um, or often ply myself with alcohol in the brethren situation because I couldn't cope with what I was going through. Yeah. So it makes me like, I feel, I feel sorry for that kid. Like what was he suffering? Yeah. Look, I've been in school situations where kids are um, smoking a little bit of pot or, but I've never been in a situation where you've got a kid who is, you know, like clearly really intoxicated every day. Um, that wasn't at a campus that I taught at. Um, and un unfortunately, you know, and I, I don't think they really did anything about it. I was going to say, unfortunately, nothing probably would have come from that because, and in in our growing up, Jane, we often heard that a leader who was a known drunk, um, a, a past elect vessel, he he said that um, alcohol makes a strong man stronger and a weak man weaker, yeah. and it was kind of like the say. story you read as a child of the Emperor's New Clothes. If you didn't agree with that, well, you were a weak man. You heard that repeated, Jane? Yeah, the kids would say it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It's their, their instant yeah. permission to, well, I want to be a strong man, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the, the unspoken implication of that is that if you're not drinking, you're trying to hide something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think there was also, sorry, that's maybe not quite right, but there's also a saying that said something about speaking the truth or. Um, yeah, no one speaks the truth like babes, um, something and alcoholics. That was another drunk, like out yeah. of mouths of babes and sucklings. Yeah. And I think. One of the le the elect vessels, I don't know, I'm not quoting it, but someone somewhere added, and drunks, and it was like, ha, 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 okay, this is excusing us. Yeah. yeah. Last Easter, there was a horrible car crash in Wangaretta where um, there was a death involved. This Easter, here in North America in the States, there was a horrible car crash where a member of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church killed four people. And I'm going to read something here that was um, that was out on social media of someone who knew what happened. Um, it says, I don't know who all may have seen on Channel 2 News at 6 about the bad auto crash at the Dayton Airport. Some may know that I work part-time there driving rental cars from our prep lot to the rental garage. The vehicle that was hit was our shuttle van. The SUV that hit it ran the red light so fast that it almost broke the van in half. There were five guys in the van, co-workers of mine and friends. Four of my friends were killed instantly. The fifth is in critical condition, as well as the driver of the SUV. Please let your family and friends know how much they mean to you. We never know what tomorrow may bring. And I just want to say that the driver of this vehicle, this wasn't, that was his second accident. He had had an accident, a hit and run before this, that person followed him. And then this happened. And again, alcohol was uh, alcohol. They are thinking alcohol was a factor. I have to put it like that until it's actually publicized. But again, we are, we're seeing these horrible, horrible incidents happening that stem from exactly what you witness and what you have heard from other other teachers. And this isn't the first time we've heard this. We had another teacher that was on that um, had, there was alcohol in their water bottles at school and nothing was done about it. At some point, the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church have to wake up and realize the damage this alcohol behavior and acceptance brings to these children because they end up growing up and being exactly what just recently happened this last Easter. So it's two Easter's in a row where the last one, someone died. This one was four people died. This guy's yeah. LinkedIn profile actually has a picture that says um, the need for speed. Uh. I mean, it, 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 there's so much about these things that's disturbing. I know that, um, and and I, you know, I don't want to talk out of turn because I'm clearly not brethren, and so a lot of the things that that I think are just observations and assumptions. Um, but, but I think feel free to make definitely... them. <laughs> it's it's so can, like it's so validating to hear it from a, a non a third person perspective. So mm -hmm. let's make them. Um, it's definitely the case that women are often given the responsibility of driving so that if they get caught, they lose their life. You know, it doesn't matter so much if they well, lose their yeah. life. And then, yeah. And also the women didn't drink as much as the men. So, yes, going home from the lunches on Sunday, which the brethren call breaks, um, yeah. 
yeah, it was common that three or four of the people that you had for the break, the women would jump in the car and drive because they only had one drink. I mean, the women still do have quite an issue inside there. But yes, I mean, yeah. I can see how the the women would be the ones that would have to drive. But yeah. I remember one year, um, so we would have at the end of the year like a Christmas celebration and it would usually be they'd send us off to have lunch somewhere and, um, you know, at some point during the time the brethren men, because women don't have any position of, you know, power, so the CAs would turn up and they'd say thanks for the year and da-da-da-da-da. But then this one year they actually booked a place and we all ate together in that the brethren sat at a separate table but we're all in the same room, which was a little bit unusual. That did not my experience prior. Um, And I remember that day that the women who uh, were wives and then also um, sometimes the young women have positions within the school, um, so admin until they get married. Um, sometimes, you know, there are women that never get married and so they end up being quite old and yeah. they're still working. Um, they got really drunk <laughs> for being kind of horrified that these girls, and because, you know, um, as a female you kind of understand the vulnerability that comes along with, losing your capacity to look after yourself. So so that was quite horrifying to me, also because it's work. You know, I wouldn't get drunk at a work um, do generally. I mean, some people do, but, you know. Did you ever witness racism in there? Oh, yeah. Um, Yes, very racist. And and that that speaks to that suggestion before that the people who survive are people who so the non-brethren teachers um, that survive in the system are often people whose values align. Um, I mean, it's it's a difficult situation to teach in an environment where you feel contempt. And so, you know, when you hear a child in year three discussing um, how women are inferior and that's why they can't, you know, be in charge of stuff or whatever. So you've got a kid in year three who's, you know, possibly not the brightest kid ever, so there's no indication that this child is in any way intelligent but because they're a male, uh, they have this sense of superiority and will really openly say obnoxious things. Um, yeah. Uneducated. So there was a lot of that. And as a female teaching in the environment, so I thought of this before. I've been writing little notes as we're talking. One of the the risks of being in the school was there was <clears throat> this constant threat that the kids would turn on you. Mm-hmm. So you have this feeling that if you did something to upset one of them, you know, you asked before if I felt like some kids had power. Yeah. If you did something to upset one of them, they would all band together and then you'd be one of the teachers that was gotten rid of. Yeah. Um, they'd make and, and they would do anything like it happened at Sydney school and they essentially found it because this teacher suddenly like snapped and said, well, yeah. what if I do have a partner? What if I am gay? And the kids banded together and that teacher was disappeared. I think he took them yeah. to fair work and actually won um, because uh, for discrimination. But yeah. Yeah, it, it happens all the time. It happened all the time. So I, when I was in year seven, there were – was a teacher that essentially said they went to the Mardi Gras parade and I know he was disappeared. They like disappeared for bringing that up. And there was a lot of contention between kids not liking that person anyway. So they were like, well, here's a way to do it. And yeah, he was disappeared. Um, I mean, look, I just don't think you could ever be, out- you can't even, you can't, you can't outwardly suggest that we should be worried about the environment. They're so anti um any of that stuff like i remember you know doing a a, um discussing recycling and there's this really palpable um opposition to the idea that we need to care about the environment in any way um what year would have that been what grade like what year and as in year level yeah yeah what year level Oh, I don't even remember. I just, it's, it was a given to me. Do you I know what? There was this, a teacher. It's just very interesting because we've come again, and this is another thing that we come up against, right? Where they just have no, 
because they believe in this rapture that's coming on, they don't need to worry about the world around them. Yet, if you watch on RRT, their famous charity that's set up to keep their, their status, the things, the people that they go and support are the people that will support them completely go against the teachings that are taught in their school. And it's the hypocrisy of it that anger us ex-members that when you see RRT members going out and supporting environmental things that they don't even believe in themselves. Yeah, and it was like the same way that, that they made an, a statement to why they left the Hawkesbury, where I live, and the, they were, like, aware of current climate concerns. I'm like, you have there's never been anything further from the truth. You don't give a rat's ass about, about anyone outside of your church, let alone the environment. Yeah. So I just want to run through a list of things that I've sort of jotted down that I've heard from recent leaders of One School Global, currently uh, workers of One School Global. Um, and one of them was around the cameras. Now, recently I heard that the police were called to One School Global um, because of cameras in the boys' toilets, um, which was an interesting like, thing. Had, had you, did you hear of that? Or I mean, um, obviously so it's a different did. campus, so it's a different it's probably a different school. I don't know where you teach at, taught at, but yeah. um, it's one school global, essentially. doesn't surprise me um, in that. So, I mean, I don't think we had cameras in the toilets. Um, we had cameras in all of the rooms in the time that I was there as a response to... Um, certain incidents they would put more cameras in so yeah. um, you know and, and i do believe that this was because of an incident of a boy nearly drowning in a toilet from being bullied so yeah. from what i've yeah. heard this was in response it's funny to that, that that's the reaction i mean it's not funny at all but no it's i know funny. but it's always a reaction like that you know um it, there's a behaviour that, that you don't like. So rather than address the behaviour or what yeah. is uh, facilitating the behaviour, let's put in a 1,000 cameras so that they can't do it or that... Um, or that we can catch it happening, which yeah. is which is essentially what this person that reached out said. And, she's, and it said here that, you know, that there are cameras in every school and I've heard yeah. that these are monitored for the whole school day by a roster of parents and board members and where they've heard of members actually contacting the school to tell teachers that the students are doing something wrong. I mean, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. in terms of so, privacy, I mean, if works, you're sending your kids level. to a certain school, are there a plethora, without knowing that there are a plethora of brethren members monitoring your kids at school? I just, it all sounds mm. very murky. I mean, it's very, very problematic. Schools are not... Yeah. <laughs> Um, one of the things that, I, that I've, because leading up to this, I've sort of been thinking about, um, you know, things that are important. One of, the, one of the notes that I'd written down is that, you know, in Australia we had the Royal Commission, Commission yes. into Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, and the thing that they actually identified as being the biggest risk factor was access to kids. So in a school situation, anyone that isn't, um, you, you know, approved that doesn't have working with children or is a registered teacher shouldn't have access to to that stuff and yet here you are we're saying that people outside of the school are accessing information on kids that's really problematic that's disturbing um i know yeah. cameras were everywhere the reason that i say i'm not that surprised is because it was divulged to us that they were not only recording video but they were recording sound yeah. um and they said because it's not lawful oh you know we can't use it for anything but but they're still listening and why there, there was very little understanding of privacy for teachers or students um you know and I guess that all stems from that mentality that we are the chosen people, we are special. So um, at the end of the day, we own you, you you're you're working for us, you're our property, you're, you know, like that whole yeah. mentality that yep. is rough within the community. Back back on the camera note, yep. also, like, we knew that all our laptops growing up in there and our phones were all bought through UBT, were all monitored heavily, um, Edited, like heavily controlled so that you couldn't access 
anything within the outside world. You can download apps, you can do anything. Like it was what they, what you're allowed to have, which was purely communication. Um, that was it. Even to the point where now they have, WhatsApp have introduced a thing called, um, like a social media sharing platform where you can have channels where you can, you know, we can put our pod, the podcast to put their thing on there, like different little things like that. So now they have made everybody get rid of WhatsApp and move over to Signal. So, and this has happened time and time again throughout history. When they first had it, when we moved to Blackberries, they had Blackberry Messenger, and that was moved to WhatsApp because Blackberry Messenger did a similar thing where it became, you know, obviously big companies are trying to get on board with social media and be a part of that world. And so they evolved. But the brethren don't like that, obviously, because that means access to the real world. And so this this person has, has reached out and said laptops are monitored. They know by the IT company and parents. And I'm assuming Plymouth Brethren Christian Church members, um, it's where they receive screenshots, and I quote, every 30 seconds and are alerted to keywords or searches. And oh, I know yes. this for a fact because a girl that we helped escape from year 12, she was, you know, very, very intelligent. She won a scholarship and did all this stuff prior to help, like setting up and leaving. And she was found out. And there's only one way that that, that could have been is because they were alerted to her keyword searches. Wow. Yeah, they, they, um, I don't think there's any secret about that monitoring. I know. Um, it should be a huge red flag. Like yeah. the invasion of privacy by, by people that aren't even – um approved to work with kids like you say yeah uh, look we had a program that we used where we could um view students um screens laptop. oh yeah their screens um we could see their um so if they were emailing during that monitoring um i know that there was an email sent out at one point reminding teachers that it wasn't ethical for them to monitor a student's <laughs> computer outside of their own class um so people would be monitoring monitoring students computers um either outside of school hours or outside of class time um Certainly, you know, they, they have the um, self-directed learning, so they have the, the period of time when they're in the learning centre. Um, they would monitor what they were doing then. Um, th those, those things are things that I found really disturbing because a lot of teachers loved being able to view what was going on. Um, you know, that's not sort of how I see it. I know uh as... As a young person, I would have been horrified at the idea that everything I did and said was being watched. Um, but then also on top of that, it gives, like, I'm thinking about the kid that was was clearly suffering and reached out to a help service. It really inhibits mm -hmm. that. Like, you know that yeah. you're being watched and you already know that it's it's a big issue to contact the real world or the outside world for help. Yeah, um, yeah like, it, it, it would bring it back again, insulate even more, right? Yeah. I mean, look, I think that's one of the things for me that the takeaway um, that was really disturbing is that I, I, when I first started, I felt like there should have been a really clear separation between how the school ran and the school's um, legal responsibility to meet duty of care and child safety and all of that stuff, and then brethren needs. It, it seemed to me that there shouldn't, that it, the school should have been able to say this is our legal requirement, that is a non-negotiable, except yeah. that's not the reality of it. That's not how it works. People are, um, uh, uh, look, I'm going to say people get paid really well. The truth is my experience having left is that the pay wasn't that good. And the conditions weren't that good. I, I um, now work in an environment where I'm getting paid significantly more. I have less responsibility. Um, so, you know, probably I think less that, chaos. <laughs> yeah. But it, but, but that's one of the things that happens when you're there is that you're also then isolated because um, in a normal teaching situation, teachers are part of a community, a broader community. Um, the reality of that is that you sort of a little bit isolated um, because it is so different to anywhere else. And so, um, I mean, you kind of get indoctrinated, I guess. Um, certainly people that have been there for a long time, it was very obvious to me that they no longer had 
an objective perspective and didn't really know right from wrong a lot of the time. Um, yeah. I guess, yeah, the lines would get blurred after a while if you're, yeah, like I said, you're de- you become desensitised, you know. It's like in the, yeah, same, it. the same way that when I left, you know, I never experienced horror other than the horror of being part of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church community. And I remember going with my friends to a haunted house thing and being absolutely and utterly terrified. And now I, you know, you know, I listen to true crime to help me sleep. Like it's, it's a very, it's the original, you do become desensitized to it, right? Like you do. Yeah, yeah. And in the same retrospect, in the same way with, with working in that community over a period yeah. of time. It becomes um, the normal. Just just because I've just thought of it, you asked before if I experienced any racism. Um, I remember one time we had a new teacher starting and um, the teacher was dark-skinned and we had a meeting where one of the leaders expressed that it would be good for the kids to be exposed to this kind of diversity. And I remember sitting there thinking, this is like a social experiment. This person is going to be crucified. Yeah. Um, And unfortunately they were like, I remember growing up, like not all because some were very well um, able to stand up for themselves, but they, you are born in in that community. You are inherently racist. And I, you know, I really struggled with it growing up because I'm like, there were elements to me that I didn't like about the way you thought and you're like hang on where does that come from you know like what yeah. that's a teaching from back then you know um so do you know what survive? how yeah do you know how that worked out for the teacher uh lasted about two terms mm. <laughs> and then left um because um so uh, the person was dark-skinned and female so that you know didn't have much going for them in the end um and in terms of a brethren didn't community. Understand, didn't understand the, the situation that they were walking into. I mean, um, you know, observationally it is a lot easier for some people to teach in that environment than others depending on um, their heritage, what they look yeah. like culturally, yeah. which I guess is, you know, true of any teaching situation, but in this situation um really quite different one of the other things is so the the community is so full of hypocrisy so like that thing of not voting i remember at one point um we were having an election and i'd never been in a situation where kids were so interested in what was going on politically and i said to a class but you guys don't vote do you and um one of the students then kind of coyly said we vote with the power of prayer, which was a bit of an eye opener for me because you know that clearly seems absurd um, from the outside. Um, yeah. But then you know, as time went by, because they were so political, like wearing badges, and everyone believed the same thing. I remember a student being very, very anxious that their desired leader wasn't going to be re-elected, and. Um, that student felt like it was going to be the end of the world, that if that person didn't get in, the world was going to end. So you're just like trying to reassure the kid, making sure that you didn't express any of your own political views because then they'd all turn on you and, you know, that would make life difficult. Um, yeah, and it, it I is mean, look, like- that was actually one of the reasons I didn't want to stay any longer. I thought I can't bear to live through another federal election. Election. When- yeah, just it was just horrifying and too much pressure to not because, you know, you have a bit of an off day where you're a little bit tired and the kids say something obnoxious and all you want to do is set them straight. You yeah. just want to say that's not right and people have different opinions and the world isn't going to end. Um, yeah, but then again, they're, they're not taught how to have. They're not taught yeah. how to have that difference of opinion and they don't have those conversations where we can be in a room, gr- a group of people in the same room and have difference of opinions and have a discussion. They don't have that, right? It's all. I don't know. They don't want, to be set, yeah. don't want to set and, themselves aside at, at all. So, yeah. No. And, and also in a different perspective to that, growing up with those thoughts, you yeah. did think major, they did use major, I, I, I'm going to say like, catalyst like major events like elections or 
earthquakes or wars or they did use that in a very superstitious way to bring about the control on and and in turn yeah. fear to keep you well within that community because if you ever leave it you're not going to know when the king of the north is going to come down which is the opening of the seventh seal or whatever you know whatever whatever superstitious i know i'm not quoting that right but they were always using like the the um george bush going to the middle east was the opening of this seal and this we're up to this seal in the bible and that, like that fear of of we're, we're already conscripted we've already got the time set out for us we're just going to listen to one man tell us when exactly we're lining up and that could have been an election like i remember sitting in a lounge room at my grandpa's where bruce hales was there and it was the time of the election where kevin rudd julia gillard like that government the labor government where the, we had all been praying wouldn't get in and you know the power of prayer just wasn't powerful enough because they did get in and he says in the lounge room well the lord knew i needed a break from the media so that's why he put them in and that was his <laughs> reasoning and then from yeah. there on flooded out to the rest of the community that this was for a break for our brother oh that's fine like you were always on on eggshells not knowing what major event was going to take place and and for what reasoning it had whether it was the end of the world because bruce howells the leader was sitting at, in church meetings going it could be three years it could be five years I don't know. We don't know the day nor the hour, but that doesn't mean we don't know the time nor the month. Like they'd say things like that to throw you off and and ringing that control, ringing that fear. Because if you can say to them, to your followers, I know when the rapture is coming. It's three years. Just because I don't know the day nor the hour doesn't mean I don't know the time nor the month. You're you're like, well, I want to be around for that. I don't want to be left in what is going to be a catastrophic event. Um, so that that is why there is so much heightened anxiety with children growing up in the schools around things like a simple federal election where I mean, really it's so, strange. It's, so yeah. it's so strange for the kids to be so politically activated but then not um participate in the system um so not vote um yeah. and then of course you know we know that actually they do influence the system significantly yeah. Which money, is, money talks, right? Yeah, sort of corrupt. Yeah, and yeah. right now with all of the stuff that's happening, the ATO raids and everything. I mean, are us attacking them is what they're calling it. This is all the end of the days. So this, the, that's the solace that they're giving them right now. Is I've had a few insiders ring me and be like, "That's that's what they're telling them that this is the end of but the days." Concerns this, me though. Cheryl. This is Does supposed to be me? what it's like. This is what it's supposed to be like. This is the end of the days. This is how it's going to be. Um, and you know, like, could you imagine feeding that to like a five-year-old or a six-year-old? And that brain's not going to understand what those mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember, I remember being getting told that and going into Sunday morning meeting. And I was so scared that the earth was yeah. going to open up during Monday or Sunday morning communion. And it would just open up and I was going to be swallowed. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that, I mean, that's another thing, um, you know, having grown up in, um, it wouldn't, I don't think that it's reasonable to say as a Christian, because I don't think that myself or my family have ever really actively, you know, we've never gone to church or whatever, but I did go to a church school. My children have gone to church schools. I'm familiar with the Bible. I'm familiar with the concept of Christianity. Um, and my experience of it is acceptance and empathy yeah. and love. And that is Everything not what... the opposite of the brethren. Yeah. It's very um, uh, domineering and, and it comes from a base of, of feeling guilty and... Um, there's a really nasty thread. So that that's one of the things too that I, I sort of, um, you know, initially wasn't apparent, but over time this, this thread of contempt and a lack of empathy for each other. Yeah. So the kids were kind. They were, they could be really nasty and it and was it can, And it probably did come out in forms of humour, like humour, but poor yeah. forms of humour because I know myself was was part of that you know, ecosystem, as they like to call it. Yeah. Um, but on, yeah. Yeah, okay, go down your list. Yeah, yeah, oh. keep going down your list. Yeah, so there was something else I wanted to bring up 
um, was, oh yes. So did you ever experience any homophobia in, in terms of bullying and, and was it quite obvious and confronting? Like it, how, how was that? Um, yes. So, um, I remember one of the first times, I mean, I was aware of the fact that clearly it wasn't a choice. You couldn't choose to be gay. That wouldn't be accepted. Um, I remember a class, I think it was a year eight or year nine class and a girl. So we're talking about, um, probably the very beginning of puberty, so still really a little girl. I remember a girl very loudly saying something um, to the effect of what she thought should happen to a gay man, and I think it was in reference to music, like someone said something about music and they're like, oh, he's a whatever, and then, you know, he should be. It was quite a violent end that this girl suggested this person should come to. Um, yeah. And I remember being horrified, not not even just at the homophobia, but that a 14-year-old girl would suggest that something so violent should happen to anyone. I guess that's a little bit sexist in itself, that, that I was horrified that it was um, what I considered to be a little girl. Um, there were but that some is generic, though. That's a, a very generic reaction. Um, just yeah. to share an experience from another teacher, she said they had like a little hand template, right, and they had to write, write on each finger things. I think it was like what they wanted the world to be better at or what they want to get rid of to make the world a better place. Was that was that a podcast? We did it in a pod we we did talk about it in a podcast. I'm just trying to think I don't remember doing that activity, but just you talking about it, I'm I can imagine because because that is something that you learn with experience. It's like I'm not going to do that because that if I do that, I'm going to hear things that I don't want to hear, not Yeah, that you'll have to list here that I find really abhorrent. Yeah. Well, and this teacher said to me that one of the, or I, I, it must be a familiar, it must have happened over a couple of things, but the, one of the most things that, that was written on one of the fingers was if we got rid of gay people, yeah, the, yeah. the world yeah. would be a, a better place. But, you know, that, that speaks like the, the hypocrisy of it all. They'll have this idea about that, but then they'll love a musician who's you, like, I feel like Elton John is one of the accepted I think they quite like a lot of his music and yet. No, not <laughs> anymore. Like, they used to. Okay. Because um, well, now yeah. they've worked out that he's gay. Yes. It's I mean, <laughs> it was pretty obvious, but yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Same with, uh, yeah. Well, in another instance, we had a um, an end of term activity um, and the kids, you know, like they have these days where they'd raise money for some charity or something and there'd be a theme. And so uh, the kids got dressed up as um, like workmen. Um, we yeah. got a message shortly afterwards that there was to be no cross-dressing and that was because the girls wore pants. This, this happened oh. too with, with the, yeah. But the funny thing is, though, yeah. in my class, the, the girls weren't allowed to wear pants, but the boy who, hilarious, that they wanted, there was a skit that we did and one of the boys dressed up as a female. They all wanted me to do it. And I was like, my internalised homophobia was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I, will not be, I will not let them draw two conclusions. Like I already was teased for being poof and like gay. Yeah. And you know, I, at that point, it was like, absolutely not. So they got the other kid in the class, which is hilarious to reflect back on now. Um, he was also one of the biggest bullies, but also highly effeminate. And yeah, it's just but the girls weren't allowed to, to put pants on, but the boys could, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was a strange. I mean, and you know, how do you avoid that? Because yeah. it's so absurd. Um, what else? I mean, over the years, there were a couple of kids that, uh, and as a as a teacher, you don't want to make assumptions. I don't want to assume that because a child, like I'm going to say a boy, is a little bit effeminate, that that means that they're yeah. anything other than who they are. Like you don't want to make assumptions. Um, but I know shortly before I left a student revealed to another teacher not myself and so this kind of plays into that idea that you spend the whole time worried 
that you're going to hear something that you don't want to hear. So this student revealed to um, a teacher that he was questioning his sexuality. Um, I think, I believe, actually, he might have been questioning his gender, which is just like an added layer of complication. <laughs> wow, um, he must have been highly, highly intelligent or, or and aware because I was too afraid to tell anybody. It wasn't until, like, my cousin, who is also gay, said to me, you're gay, Ben, I know it, and so am I. Yeah. Then I was like, okay, I can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, and I don't know who the student was. I have a couple of kids that um, that I think it may have been. Um, certainly not the student that, that everyone obviously, like there were a couple of kids that, you know, you go, oh, that kid's clearly gay. Um, not one of, not one of those, not that student. Um, but th they also expressed that it wasn't an option and a sense that they weren't safe. Um, that teacher reported it to the next level who said, we're not going to say anything. And so, you know, then, then you've, you've got this kid existing in an environment where they are not allowed to be who they are and where they don't feel safe because if and you know it's impossible to hide if if it gets out they're going to be persecuted they're going to be ostracized from their family i mean a living it, example it, of it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and to me that was devastating because it's impossible not to speculate to go oh, is it this kid is it that kid it was horrifying to me to know that it was any of them i guess about, i guess why brought up the homophobia thing is that yeah. and the reporting and like it's all kind of linked right is that I, I have a source who worked for one school global and one school Australia and they've come forward and told me about a system they put in place or were putting in place um and it was an outsource like it was an organization that students could anonymously report bullying from an outside like to an outside organization, a third party, not the brethren. And so they got the person in, she came to the precinct and this person spent the whole day with her, filming her, creating content, and they were going to use to push her platform. And then one of the brethren looked at her, found her on social media and found out she was a lesbian. And then they dropped it completely and pushed instead to have a smart sheet, which I think they still use today with which students could anonymously report bullying instead. And then the smart sheet is the link that's on their global website you can see today. Um, so they, instead they were like, hang on, hang on, like, no, we, we don't, can't fully vet everybody. So let's just keep it all internal. And yeah, I just, I, I guess I wanted to put that out there to ask your thoughts on that. And yeah, I'll, which will lead into something else I want to chat to you yeah. about. But just, yeah. Um, I mean, look, Australian schools have to provide, it's, it is law that you provide um, a space that is safe and doesn't discriminate and all of that stuff. So to work in an environment where, you know, you're clearly not doing that is um, pretty awful. Um, and then I, I did the reporting situation... situation. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, that wasn't reported. Even though, um, if it had if it had been me that the student had come to, I would have had the distinct feeling that they weren't safe, um, and I would have felt very clearly that that needed to be reported. It wasn't yeah. reported because reporting would be worse than yeah. the situation they're in already, uh, because then they would definitely, you know, what the the fear. Is of being found out. So if you report it, they're found out. Um, I know there was a a, um, a leader, like I said before, who did some mandatory reporting and and got a lot of grief and ended up, you know, leaving. Not yes, long after. And, and I know that their, their family was affected by it, like yeah. to a point where the brethren made it very difficult for them. And I do know, like a source has said to me, um, and I quote staff aren't allowed to suggest any support services such as headspace to kids in crisis or offer offer support to parents yeah 
You know, often what happens is these things come in place after there's a bit of a breach. So I know there was a regional campus that had a student who was suffering from some pretty serious um, mental health issues that led into forms of self-harm. Wow. And that student was allowed to attend um, counselling and support yes. outside of the Brethren, yes. um, but I don't know that that continued for very long. And so there's always this reaction. Um, well, that's, you know, that's, that's right, and that there is another or something very similar. I don't know if it's the same person, but a source has told me that they had counselling which then the counsellor obviously being non-brethren and fully aware of of their profession and, and their duties as a professional to report, then heard or then discovered that the person then opened up about the sexual abuse that was happening, who then reported it. Then obviously authorities, the police got involved. And I think that person's maybe in, maybe in uh, I won't say that actually because I don't want to confuse stories, but, um, yeah, essentially then it was all cut. Like that's why it was absolutely not allowed to like like you say it's a reaction to something happening by them opening up a little bit and then like no hang on this is opening up a big can of worms that we don't want to happen and if in turn it's going to affect our name um so pull back and create new rules around it in which you know this source has said staff are not allowed to suggest any support services um and then also went on to say they want a list of names of any professionals that the students are seeing outside of school which isn't that a breach of confidentiality oh yeah, there's, there's not much um, by way of privacy or respect for privacy, that's for sure. And on that, on note, that subject of reacting, um, yeah. one of the things I think is you assume, or I certainly did when I started, that there are rules and that the rules are the same for everyone. But once I was there for a little while, you you know, we'd have these kind of um, national assemblies where the different states would share stuff, um, and then you'd go, hang on a second, they're doing drama. How come, like, in the state that what? I'm in, we don't do drama? Or so wow. it's different across different sections and then in the time that that I was there you know we have a subject that the kids were allowed to do and then something would happen and it would be cancelled they'd no longer do that subject because yes was one of them early childhood um no no was not that, that I'm but was that I mean it Matt actually Martin? happened more than once so, like, you know, we'd have some event or um, some subject that they were allowed to do via um, via distance ed that would then be cancelled or um, some extracurricular thing where we'd have teachers coming in and taking individual lessons that would be cancelled, um, tutoring that would be cancelled. But then you'd yeah. see that in another state they're still doing it. So so yeah. my understanding of that is that it's very centralised. It's not like you, you know, small groups are controlled and it's yeah. it's not one big network where the rules apply to everyone and it's open and everyone understands the rules. I feel like it's the rules are always in a state of flux. Yeah. And I think, I think they do bring that all together every now and then to try and, like, put it smashed across the board. Like I remember all of a sudden the girls weren't allowed to do early childhood studies at my school. And yeah. we all knew that that stemmed from the Gosford campus. Um, somebody who was studying, they blamed it on early childhood. A girl that was in that year 10, 11, 12, that age group when you did it, um, fell pregnant <laughs> in school. She knew right. too much. And from one of my friends that, that have left the brethren that, she did early childhood. She said, you know that if you were doing early childhood, it's not from the early childhood studies that made you fall pregnant. Like <laughs> you were caring for a baby for however many weeks, like those fake dolls. And she said, you wanted to throw that thing. It was nothing yeah. about that that made you want wow. to have children. She said, it's probably the a lack of understanding. The <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but that's, that's because the brethren men are in charge. And like, well, it must be because they do early childhood. So let's cancel that. And that, that was that we all knew that that's why they didn't. And, but saying that, Sydney school still did it at a certain point. So it was very, like you say, it's not, it's open to whoever has the, more, the most power, I think. I mean, I think uh, too that there are 
um, there's conflict with curriculum and brethren beliefs. So the Australian curriculum says um, that kids need to learn about Indigenous Australians. Yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> um, you know, different cultures. Um, there was something else. I was thinking in which the brethren have no respect for yeah. what I mean I remember on. um when I was there one of the teachers trying to get them to do a welcome to country you that know that would not have gone down very well at standard, all standard very standard at any other school happens all the time now yeah. um yeah no didn't go it was like a complete you may as well have you know it's Might just as well blasphemed, yeah. Yeah, lots of resistance to the suggestion that you would acknowledge. Yeah, the, the hypocrisy. And- yeah, that's right. You you would acknowledge that you know their white supremacist ideas are not. Sorry, uh, environmental concerns. So that is part of the Australian curriculum. Okay. Um, yeah. And you know, there's there's a lot of resistance to that because I don't know. Is there there's some sort of thing about taking? what you want from the land or the earth or... Well, they do say, the you know, spoil the Egyptians. Anybody outside of the brethren are classified as Egyptians. So, like, like the Israelites that fled Egypt, was it Israelites? Um, <laughs> whenever the people fled Egypt, they took everything they could, the Hebrews, they took everything from um, the Egyptians and that's their whole mentality is the, the thieving of the Egyptians... God, it makes me sound like a terrible Bible study student, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, but the whole, the whole, that whole mentality, though. But this is what I want to point out: the hypocrisy, and that makes so much, so much of us so angry about the rapid relief team, the, the fake charity that they've set up. Is that they're like acknowledging NADOC Day, and we acknowledge NADOC Day. I'm like, you don't care about oh, yeah. First First Nations people. You don't care about it. You campaigned against Sorry Day. You campaigned against everything that that represented. Like, and I remember the hatred that they had for that community, for any community that isn't their, their own um, or that that is confronting for them, even to the point where interracial marriages aren't allowed because, well, it's not, one of the leaders said it's not comely. Like, it's unpleasant to look at. That's what not comely oh, means. <laughs> so that's why interracial marriages aren't allowed because, your perception of beauty or what looks good is only white people. Mm. I'm sorry, I beg to differ. Like it, it's it's infuriating because, and more so on your part because you had to work with these loons and then see mm-hmm. these poor innocent children, you know, being taught this shit, right? Like that's yeah. that's the part that's just I'm. But part of my mind is just so full right now from listening to everything that I've listened to. Is it's just absolutely insanity and so hypocritical of yeah. how they run their schools versus what they partake in with the rapid relief team and what they give the perception and the this face that they give the world are two completely different things and i mean you it, it it up- so it's so obvious to everybody but them it's yeah. it's really it's and it's it's almost embarrassing like it's so obvious that you don't hold the same values to the same point where like, and it's interesting that this was sent to me about Headspace. Um, you know, they donate donated food boxes to this amazing organization called Headspace. And so a couple of us reached out to Headspace and said, do you know that you're the, the organization, the rapid relief team you're dealing with, I would be interested to know if they would donate the same food boxes to you if it was in support of the pride event that you go to. And yeah. sure enough, the rapid relief team, uh, well, well, they realise that the rapid relief team is doesn't hold the same values, and I don't think they work with them yeah. anymore. Mean, just, meanwhile, if a student accesses Headspace, they're yes. in trouble with the breach of ICT. <laughs> yes, that kind of leads me into where I want to ask about uh, some uh, sources sent me a couple of things that I want to ask you about. Um, apparently, there is one counsellor employed by the whole school for the whole of Australia with a months long waiting list. This counselor does sessions over Zoom. So potentially are they recorded? Like, is that not a breach of confidentiality? Uh, um, Certainly all of our classes were recorded. All of our Zoom sessions were recorded. Um, So I imagine that they would be. um, I mean, that was common knowledge. That wasn't 
There's no, there no secrecy about that. I'm not aware of any counsellor. That certainly wasn't something that was... Um, well, I don't think they would advertise it. So I'm thinking it's taken from the smart sheet or whatever it is, the, the, the register, yeah. like any, any interest needed um, in yeah. that area. Because then they've gone on to say all referrals to this counsellor or other professionals need to be approved by the chain of command up to the national level of brethren. So essentially removing any confidentiality. So you've just got yeah. somebody who's high up in the brethren either because of wealth or family connections having a say on your child's mental health or, yeah. or professional that they can speak to. And they've also said that um, on top of that, all professionals, so I think psychiatrists, speech pathologists, all need to be vetted by the board and reports have to be sent to the school. Um, they want to list some names of any professionals that the students are seeing outside of the school. And like I said earlier, staff aren't allowed to suggest any support services such as Headspace to kids in crisis um, or offer support to parents. Definitely that wouldn't be something that you would do. I oh, mean, it's so disturbing. It's so disturbing. I I'm it really not is. Like that's the hard part. That's the hard part with all of this is that. You're not talking about adults though, right, either. We're talking about That's kids. what I mean. Like my heart, I'm going to like, I'm going to need therapy after this podcast. It's all I'm going to know is I'm going to have to go to therapy for myself because my heart is just, this is, these, this is kids. These are absolute yeah. kids that are being so brainwashed and manipulated and just, could you imagine their push pull of their brain in this where they see yes. RRT being sponsored by Headspace sitting there yet the same person who probably reached out to this mental helpline got, got into trouble for it, understands what Headspace is like, is so they're poor brains. That's all I can think of is their poor yeah. brains that are so twisted. These schools, I they, they need to be shut down. Like, I'm sitting here quiet, trying to just yeah. absorb this all. And I want to be realistic and I want to be fair in what I'm saying. But ultimately, these schools should not be running. They just should not be running. These kids should be in normal public schools, normal. Or if they, yeah, if they're going to be run, they're run by the government. They, by, they've not got by to the be run by the government. And they have to be run by the can government. Go to these schools, right? They need to be able to mix with other students. They need to be able yeah. to mix with the real world because this whole idea of taking these, the you know, setting up the schools that were set up by our beloved brother John Hales was all about you know protecting our kids. Where was the protection when I was sexually abused in that school? Where was the protection when I was put in a room of detention with all these boys and was sexually molested by one? Where where was that protection for me? And for all the other kids that have suffered in these schools, where is the protection? Yeah, there's no protection. It's all a farce, and, and it's it needs to yeah. come undone. It needs to um, it needs to be investigated. I think um, it, you know. So I've listened to a couple of your podcasts and um, the stories, and there are a couple of things that are really d disturbing to me. One of them is that the the whole um, system of the community, the way the community is set up, is inherently dangerous to women. So there's a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. which puts them in a position where they are statistically more likely to be abused. So that's really problematic, like no access to money, um, all of that stuff. That's problematic. But they then you cripple have you for the real world. They really cripple you for, for getting yeah. out and escaping, in particular women. Yeah. That's so true. I, 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 just simply, you know, we know that um, conversations where women are degraded um, uh, increase the, the likelihood of domestic violence. So their their whole, quite openly, the whole system puts women in a position of vulnerability. Um, and then the way that the schools are set up, so. You know, if a kid is being disciplined, there's a point at which they'll have a meeting with the CA and that might be a 15-year-old girl in the company of a 35-year-old man who is not a teacher, who doesn't have a duty of care like a teacher does. And they'll or have a police a check clearance. Yeah, uh, yeah, I imagine I mean, they'd have to have working with children, but that's, you know, a fairly... I don't um, think they would have back yeah. in my day because some of those yeah. those 
Um, well, with this kids, you wouldn't. It wouldn't happen in another school. So in another yeah. school, there wouldn't be that one-on-one -on -one kind of meeting in a closed room. Um, it just the system is in place so that that it avoids that because we know that the the likelihood of um, child sexual abuse is increased with access. So schools to protect themselves, to protect children, to protect teachers, set up systems where that doesn't happen. So in this instance, that happens. And then um, like you guys have discussed so disturbing. before um, where um, kids are removed from their families. Yep. So at yeah. one point, um, we had a situation where um, out of nowhere, the discipline policy or the behavioural policy, so the policy that outlined what would happen, so, you know, you get a warning, you get three warnings and then you get a detention, whatever it is, at another school that might be the case. Um, these posters were put up around the school and the last point was that, that the child would be sent to another school. N now, that means going to live somewhere else. Yeah. Away from your parents. Because you, we know in the Brethren that the communities already are quite stretched to get to one school and make it central. Like, yeah. so for you to go to another school means you're a whole probably state or, or another lo locality away, not even locality because that's within your yeah. interchange. So, so like, as a teacher, that's horrifying. As a parent, it's horrifying. There's no way that I would send my kids even... Um, I can't imagine even to family as discipline that that would be something that I would see as acceptable. So these kids are removed from um, their homes. They can't access um, help outside of the, like it's all, it all sets itself up. It's, it's illegal really fostering. And, and that, it yeah, very much is illegal leads, fostering, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it leads it into that elite, that topic we've covered before, the illegal fostering. And the thing is, though, Jane, you've got to realise you wouldn't also let a church say to you, you can't speak to your kid because he left the church. So these yeah. people are so indoctrinated that it's nothing to them. Like my cousins yeah. who were taken away from their parents and shifted somewhere else because they weren't deemed fit to look after them, which... Is, is not their business, anybody's business within the church leadership to make that yeah. point of call. Um, yeah, it's 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 psychologically <laughs> years of brainwashing to be able to, for them to look over that dot point and go, well, that's just, yeah, of course, why wouldn't we send our kids somewhere else? Yeah. So I, I just remember that poster going up and, and um, thinking, why isn't anyone else disturbed by this? This yeah. is... Yeah. You know, it's horrifying, but people kind of are like, oh, it's this system, it's not my business, da-da-da. Um, my last yeah. dog. Oh, go on. We know, we know with, with just from other people who have done podcasts and have told their story of um, their sexual abuse as a child, and we know that they do not keep these predators. I mean, they still go to these schools, right? Yeah. I just think that there needs to be, if these schools are to be saved, there needs to be a, a very um, thorough investigation of knowing who the church is themselves. Th let's get into the, the business side of things and then the school side of things. It has to be looked at all together. It can't just be looked at just the school because there's ways to hide what they're doing. There's yeah. ways to get around what they're doing, which is hence what's what, what's still happening, right? It just yeah. breaks my heart that these kids, generation after generations, are being completely raped of their thinking, raped of their way of processing their environment, way of yeah. their rape of how to be able to even, and I use the word raped. I'm using that word because that is what is happening. These kids have no way to get the help that they need. And yet if the teachers come in to do it, it's, it's, it's still not, it's not happening, right? This is account after account after account that we're, we're hearing. And I really implore the teachers to reach out to us um, to do these podcasts the way that we're doing them. I don't care if it's the same story that we tell 20 different times from 20 different teachers. It's the repetitiveness of it that needs to be told so that we can get these stories across. These are my nieces and nephews. These are the people that 
family that I don't even have anything to do with, that I will fight my ass off in order to know that at some point in time, a generation is saved from the actual manipulation that their minds and souls go through inside these school systems. Yeah, it's um, it's it's crazy to me. And that's, you know, I said before, I found it really difficult that there was, it seemed obvious to me that there should be a really clear separation. So I didn't understand why the leaders weren't able to say, no, this can't be like that because and this is the law, you know, this is how schools have to run. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, my experience is that brethren parents are no different to any other parents. They love their kids and they want the best for them, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of the stuff that goes on is naivety. You know, they don't, yeah. it, it, like, it's like, it's like um, the church and then also the school are, it's like institutional grooming. Everyone is being yes. groomed. Yeah. Except, yeah. and this is what I mean. Like, if they went to normal schools, they wouldn't be brainwashed. Yeah. They yeah. wouldn't have a cult because they wouldn't have the following. Say at a state school in Australia, if a child is questioning their gender, the school can actually support that child to pursue whatever they want to do without the permission of parents. So I've taught kids that are identifying as. Uh, male or female that have changed their name whose parents aren't supporting them but because of the way the law is and the protection of children schools support them in that now whether you agree with that or not um is irrelevant it is student-centered it's about protecting that child it's about supporting that child um you know here you have on one hand that going on elsewhere and then then we've got this um, institution that I mean it's it's really difficult it's yeah 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 I, I want to um to share an experience so my my in my class um I recently connected with a teacher and she like it, it there was a, a kid in my class that was she was a top scoring student at HSC English standard in 2009 and we didn't know, nobody knew that, except later on, I find out that they were told they weren't allowed to let, she wasn't allowed to accept her ward in person. So she wasn't allowed to get this acknowledgement essentially. And I think, I do wonder, is it because she was female? Is it because she was so brilliant that she could have been anything really in the real world? Um, whether that discrimination happened because, you know, out of protection, for the students that we don't want them to end up, you know, with thoughts of, well, critical thinking, right? That that would have led to, and in turn questioning the environment you're in. Um, I feel like um, I, I remember we had one year, a, a year where the ducks of the school was a female and there was kind of a suggestion that that would, might make it difficult for her to find a husband because it would be yeah. as she was too opinionated or... Yeah, you know, and that, that, that like is a known thing, like a, a contentious woman they don't want. That's what they would call it, you know, a woman with brains. Yeah. I mean, that stuff I remember, um, you know, that's really disturbing. Being female, um, I have kids of my own. They're this idea that that they're only good for having babies and, you know, like families are amazing and that, that stuff is incredible, but. Um, it should be. Well, if you ask me, they're overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's so, the, you know, that in itself is devastating because there's no happy solution to all of that. Yeah. Um, you know, while obviously you are better off, there's still that pain associated with having. Yeah, I oh, definitely. Pain. Yeah. It, and it's every day, you know, it's something you live with. It's not something you, yeah. I do, I, I know we're digressing, but I do have people say to me, oh, you know, you've been out, um, oh, my gosh, it's it's tomorrow. Uh, Monday. Wow. So, I mean, I this isn't going to air right away, but, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, I'm happy for it too. In three days' time, I celebrate my, no, I, I left in 2016, so what, what's that, eighth year of leaving? But I do say, people say this all the time, how, how have you been able to get over it? Like, 
I'm like, I don't. I just accept that it's a part of me I carry with me. Yeah. And if I need to mourn it by expressing tears or by being alone, I do. I honour it and yeah. I'm comfortable with it. Like, I think you become comfortable with it. It's not you. Yeah, I, you there know, is no to, getting over it. Not when we have yeah, families yeah. in there. There is no getting over it. You learn how to walk with it and you learn how to use the emotions as fuel to make change, right? You take your pain and give it purpose. That's what I do every single day. There is days when the pain is debilitating, but you always yeah. make yourself get up and you turn that pain into purpose. It's not about getting over it. We're not ever going to get over it. It's 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 a part of us. You learn how to walk with it. You just let it, give it wings, give it a voice, give it um, th the crayons to color with, right? Give it some color. And whilst it doesn't, yeah, and whilst it doesn't consume you and like no. at times me and Cheryl are like, oh, well, we should take a step back or yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to go yeah, actually yeah. play some sport or... <laughs> We definitely have imbalance with it I, when it gets busy, right? When it gets <laughs> busy. We're just humans. We're, yeah, we're exactly. all imbalanced yeah. and imperfect. Yeah. Who cares? A couple of last questions I want to run by your points. Um, yeah. I've had a source reach out and say that there's been a massive, which I said suggested a 70% uh, staff turnover in the last year. There's been a massive amount of people in leadership positions culled over the last two years, which, you know, from an inside perspective, we knew that anyway, that that's that happens all the time. So that's validation. Principals, heads, teachers, national and state teachers of education, they've all been announced with the same tendered resignation effective immediately message. None of them have been heard from since, which I, you know, previously mentioned suggests a NDA and a huge payout. Um, and then staff, last year were given new contracts and coerced into signing them. These included conditions around staff not posting anything on social media, which is in opposition to Brethren values, which can I add the army don't even do that. Like the, your government positions can't, can't tell you how you can, like you, you can live your life on social media. Right. Um, and, and it can't be in opposition to like the army can't even do that. Um, mm. Yet the Brethren do, which I think that that needs to be looked into. And then, yeah, so just just your thoughts on that. Um, oh, look, it's all so secretive. And um, when people leave, they don't, like, you know, oh, we don't want to announce it. Um, you know, you often would hear a rumour and then it would come out and it's 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 served up in a certain way. Um, there's lots of damage control. It, it, I mean, it, that those things are red flags in themselves. It's like there's no transparency. Um, there are, I mean, as a teacher, you have a responsibility to uphold certain values. So teachers can lose registration over bringing the profession into disrepute. Um, so in that sense, and then most workplaces have non-disclosures. In that sense, it's that seems to me fairly generic, but it's quite specific. And so they they kind of cover themselves. It's like when I first, well, no, not when I first started. I think they probably still do it now. They One of the ways they support their own businesses is, you know, brethren businesses that do uniforms. Um, they'll yeah. give you an allowance to buy uniform. Um, but the, it's quite controlled. Like I remember um, looking at it and thinking there's no way I'm going to wear any of that stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. I thought what I wanted to was buy, um, they had, men's woolen jumpers but I couldn't actually purchase men's clothing because I was female um so that's kind of funny but that that was their way of making people wear skirts making women wear skirts so they could kind of cover themselves by making it uniform if it's uniform then you can allow, you know you can request that people wow wear things. so they do this kind of controlling stuff I mean I think actually now that's probably not even possible I think you know, yeah. if you have a uniform, you have to have a pants option for women as well. Yeah. Um, yeah but that that type of manoeuvring and counter moves and, yeah. you know, chess with Bobby Fisher style is very, is very a, a practice they put into place with clever accounting and, and you know, other facets of the, of the cult. And we they know they're so good at that. 
Yeah. yeah, and then it all feeds itself. It's like, um, you know, speaking of rapid relief, um, there's no charity that is branded in the way that it is with all the paraphernalia, which is all supplied by brethren businesses. So it's like, you know, the front is that they're doing this amazing thing and, and quite possibly, you know, serving sausages to firefighters is amazing, but there's a lot of money that goes into the branding so how much of that is actually just getting, how much of this charity is just getting fed back into Brethren businesses? And then I I, um, I don't know whether this is true, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were employing the young people. So it's a way to occupy young people. Yeah. And oh, definitely. And you, not employ, you're mandatory volunteering. Like if I didn't go, my dad would be like at a bushfire event. He would be down my throat. You are going and you're <laughs> wearing that shirt. You're wearing that hat. Like it's. Yeah. yeah, but the the irony, like in the same way that it's all like an ecosystem, like you go to UBT yeah. for example, and you look at Google reviews, and they've got like forty reviews, but just running through them, I'm like, these were all just random brethrens reviewing. Yeah, like I mean, they're they're probably been there in their life. So we um, we would occasionally have a PD, so professional development that would be at Teacher Academy, Academy in Sydney in the precinct. Um, and, you know, speaking about this system, which is inherently dangerous to women, you turn up there, all the men are 35 and over, and all the women that are working there are 18, 19. These very young girls serving, you know, drinks and whatever to that but like it just I, I remember going there and feeling really uncomfortable about this situation that clearly you know just as a female a, a, as a young woman I would have been uncomfortable in that situation yeah. it would have seemed to me inherently problematic yeah and and on on the same note I remember hearing a, a story recently where a teacher told me that they were put in a really difficult position where you know two girls were discussing their work experience that they had to do in year 11, 12, year 12. They had work experience at um, a brethren, high up brethren business, um, part of the royal family. And yeah, essentially working at this business, they, one of the brethren men came into the lunchroom behind them and did some things that are very disturbing. Um, like licking her neck and things like that, that are very, or sniffing her hair and, and just very um, predatory grooming yeah. style behaviours that should, concerns should have been raised. And it was like, well, how do I do this when the person I'm speaking to is directly involved? Um, and, and this and is the problem. And, and I guess the success of keeping the cult within itself and the schools, because they do, they keep it like this, um, the same, these systems in place so that nothing can get out. Nothing, nobody does want to report because at the end of the day, it's going to cause more damage than to them and the student and then it will affect um, in a good I'm, way. I'm certain, and Cheryl, maybe you can confirm this, but in that situation, if a woman was to say something, then it would be kind of put back on her Yeah. somehow she had. Yeah. Yeah. Why were you um, showing off your neck? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you use good shampoo for your hair? You know, yeah, come yeah, on. Awesome. You're just tempting yeah. men. Yeah. yeah Never exactly. the man's problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things at the end of the year, there is a dinner that they have. It's usually um, set up by the second to last year of school for the school leavers. Um, and at the school that I was at, the kids would set up in a room. They would black out all of the windows. There'd be no teachers in there so it was notoriously a time when they'd get really drunk now there's no scenario in any school situation where teachers aren't supervising it's you know that's not appropriate but these they would have this luncheon and then uh, towards the end there was kind of this compromise where they'd have uh, brethren supervisors but that's still problematic because they're not teachers it's a school environment and they're not um, cleared. Like none of these, I've never heard of a brethren, like any of the brethren teachers that or supervisors that I knew getting any sort of clearance. Yeah. I mean, I just can't, I can't, they'd have to have. Probably like, now, but I, yeah, probably have, now. Yeah. Schools don't have, people don't come onto school campuses without 
Um, like, for instance, um, my husband suggested that um, I could perhaps have my car serviced at school. And like, we can't, you can't do that because you couldn't have someone coming onto school campus to do it, even though it's the car park and it's not near kids. Um, yeah. It, you know, can't work. There. So I, I just, I don't see, but it, it wouldn't, at the same time, it wouldn't really surprise me because they find ways around these things. Like, you know, you only get caught if, if it's revealed yeah. or something goes wrong. Yeah, 100%. No, I just know because, like, my mum would be at school or doing canteen or whatever. She would had never sat down and did any clearance or any checks. It was yeah. never in place. And same with the older men that used to teach Bible studies. There was absolutely not any clearance. Like, there's just not. Yeah. There wouldn't have been. But, you know, they, I don't even think they do that anymore. So, who knows? Like like you say, they do evolve um, to protect their name The tiny little increments that they implement so let's to wrap this up jane what would you want to say to one school global to make changes that they need to make like if you were to summarize everything that you you've come across what would you say to them if you were able to have a one-to-one -one face conversation with them and they were actually going to listen to you um oh, i feel like that's such a difficult question to answer um i mean look I, I think i left at the point where i felt like it was hopeless um because mm. there was a period of time where i i believed that there was a real effort to do things the right way um but the point at which i left was when i came to the conclusion that that wasn't true um I think that most importantly, there shouldn't be any grey area around child safety. I don't think that 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 can be any compromise. And religious beliefs, moral beliefs, can't allow a compromise in that area. So I guess that it would be to um, put in place the checks and balances and policies that stop that from happening to create a separation from the church and its, its beliefs so that because the, the two things can't cross over successfully at the moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I And I get it. I, I get it. And I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't know if this any of this is possible, right? Like I don't think. It's just from all the stories that land on our lap that I don't know if it's possible to save these schools because the brethren, if they don't, if they don't change their whole church system, if that doesn't get changed, the school's yeah. not going to be changed. They both go hand in hand. And yeah. um, unless the government steps up, there's got to be, there needs to be more policies. There needs to be more government involved inside this. There needs to be more rules besides just checking boxes and handing that into the government. Things need to be monitored. There needs to be different, um, a whole different system needs to be brought in for this. That's, that's in my, my opinion. Um, I, it's sad. It's sad that generations are being completely lost over this. And I say that, that very firmly that they get lost over this because children need to process emotions. Children need to learn how to deal with their mind. Children need to understand what it is like to have um, diversity in their conversations and what they're being taught. And they don't get that within One School Global. <laughs> One of the things um, when I was there, there's this distinct lack of respect for um, tests. And so they're not good at following rules. The kids will sort of break the rules. And I used to always wonder how they would go about doing their final year exams when they had this, like they would happily cheat. I mean, I think they thought that made them clever. Um, <laughs> and then since leaving, there's a couple of things that have come to light. Firstly, the person who is employed, now I thought they were employed by the um, curriculum body that oversees um, the final year testing. Um, they're actually employed by the school. So that person, the person that did it for many years, also um, their family owned a car dealership. And so the brethren would buy their cars from this family's 
car dealership and this person was adjudicating was the person representing our curriculum body making sure that they did their final year exams following rules so that's inherently kind of questionable but then also um you know there are certain subjects that the brethren um hold more importantly so they pride themselves on being the top of the nation for business mm -hmm. studies, studies. yeah there was an incident where um, a person representing the curriculum body um, was called into question in that there was a complaint made that the final year exam was biased towards Brethren students. And then it was discovered that this person who was heading the curriculum body for that subject was also employed by Brethren. And what? so that the conflict of interest no longer was in charge of creating the exam, although I think they are also still. So there's this. And then there's also kind of at the time that I was there, it was apparent that with um, final year studies, there's all these rules and regulations, but a lot of the assessment comes down to individual teachers. And so um, it was very clear that, that um, and, you know, to be fair, there's pressure on a lot of schools to perform well and so there is kind of a grey area, um, but definitely things were not done ethically, ethically or in some yeah. way. Yeah, so there's this kind of cheating that would go on. Well, in, in a more recent period of events, and I think this, te this teacher is going to come on and share her story as well, but so I won't take it all from her, but there was an interesting thing in the same way with chat GPT, like using AI to, it was very obvious that these students were using AI to to get their exams and, and, and all their major assessments done. Yeah. Um, and when that was brought to the attention of the brethren that were around the school, um, it was like, we don't really care, like as long as they get good results. Could, yeah, I, I, I remember a situation similar where the kids, um, a question was, because when you assess for final year, you um, moderate with other assessors, so you compare to other groups. Yeah. Um, there was a situation where nearly 80% of the students were going to fail an assessment because they hadn't done it correctly, and that was just swept under the carpet. I think we might have got our best results that year. So clearly they didn't get the penalty that they were supposed to get, the, the, that stuff. I mean, the truth is if you don't have a respect for education. See, this is what uh, I mean by I don't yeah. think one school global is savable. It's the same reason yeah, why I think. Yeah. Not it's, at all. It's, this is why. This is just, it just confirms what my gut feeling is, is that. Yeah, I I had a teacher just recently who just left, right? A one of the one of the one school global schools, um, say to me that from her years of teaching there, the kids have inherently become like less intelligent. Like it's it's like there is a an effect of the, the placebo or the effect of being remaining so insular within a community, so restricted, so kept kept hidden from rich English texts and, and other forms of media that you can access that because yeah. I, I was having this conversation saying, you know, like we were the brightest, like, oh no, you have no idea now. Like what the the they aren't getting what you kids were getting back in the day. They aren't that they're, they're not they're not they're inherently becoming less and less um engaged. I guess, in charge of, there, yeah. And that there is there's scientific evidence to back that up. There was a I think a Harvard study where done where they took parts or studied parts of our the brain of people that were in a um, cult-like community versus the real world where you have the flexibility to to use all faculties and, and explore and, and natural exploration. And it was, it, these, the use of the brain became less and less. Um, yeah. and, and I guess that kind of lines up with a lot of like, how can I get people saying to me, how can they be so stupid? How can they be like just so blinded by it all? I'm like, well, it's inherently Maybe. risky to think things outside of the doctrine. So, you know, I mean, I imagine, and I'm not there, but I imagine there's a great deal of energy put into making yourself not think things. 
hundred yeah. percent. You were taught we will do the thinking, you do yeah. the doing. Yeah. yeah. You know? In reference to the question before, what would you say to them? Um, I think that, you know, what I would say to someone else is that I wish I hadn't worked there. Um, oh, that's a powerful statement. It has taken me um, a long time and a lot of talking about it and um, a lot of, I mean, uh, you know, it's not nice to feel like you have to forgive yourself for a situation, but I went into the school um, inherently suspicious and I feel like I left a little bit damaged. Um, yeah. Still and it's so, kids. so sad to hear that. And, and it just breaks my heart. It break. It just like, yeah. it makes me, yeah. part of me still feels ashamed that this church is called to still alive because of the pain that people that were never born into it experience. And I'm out of it. Like, I want to yeah. just reach through the screen right now and hug you because <laughs> you should have never went through what you went through. I just, I don't know what we can do. I don't know what we can do to make the changes that we, that we need to. We, I don't think we can. And that's why we, we are using our voices to share this. Yeah. And Jane, thank you so much. And I think I want to say this, and I say this to every single teacher I come across as a former kid there, you know, and I think I'd be speaking on most of the kids that have left today because they, they resound with the same message. Thank you. You were in the darkest periods of our lives, the only light, the only, the only thing that stopped us from unaliving ourselves, essentially. Um, yeah, it was, it was the teachers. It wasn't, I was looking forward to going to English the next day. It was no, because that certain teacher was going to be teaching me at least one or two periods. That two periods was a great day, you know, and you might have hated, I hated maths, but I loved the teacher and that's why I chose science. Like it's very, it, yeah, I just want to say thank you. It was, very, it was, it was it, huge, a huge impact that you, I know you were so restricted and I know you, you held back so much, but you're a beacon of light for us kids. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you both for being on here today. We'll end on that note. Um, I think we all need to heal our hearts tonight after this myself. podcast. And uh, like Ben, I'm j I, I, I'm just saying I just appreciate every teacher that is still in there. Every teacher that has messaged us, messaged Ben. We have so many teachers reaching out right now. Um, please know that if you need to find out how to report what you've witnessed, Email us at info.getalife at proton.me. Reach out to Ben on um, at xcultboy on his social media platforms. Together, we can make changes. I do believe that. It's just hard to know where to start. And I think that we just need to go back to the core of why we started these podcasts. And it was about survivors coming on. And that's not just survivors from those that were born and raised inside there. It's also survivors that have worked with the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church members. It's also survivors that have taught the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church children. We're all survivors. And I think when we come together like this, there's, there's power in numbers. There's power in using our voices. So I really, really implore the teachers to reach out be brave enough to come on and do it the same way that Jane has done it. We've had another one that's come on before. We know that there are some that are wanting to come on. I, I would take 50 of you and do you all separately because the repetition needs to be heard in there. I had a recent lever tell me that during his during the struggles that they went through in leaving, what went through their head was the re repetitiveness of the stories that they listened to. So... Um, it doesn't you feel matter. less alone, right? You feel less alone. Yeah, yeah. And, and in doing that, there's strength in numbers. And I know there's a huge fear about the litigation because the brethren do tend to come after people that speak up. What's happening now, the revolution that is happening now, yes, it's um, different. The, the activism that is happening now is, is unprecedented. It's never happened before. Mm -hmm. And I, I firmly believe that there will be a huge, like the ATO are investigating them. There will be a huge outcome from this. And be on the right side of history as we tackle what is a a toxic community that has so many victims within it um, that need saving. That have very good people inside there. Yeah. And it's those, to yeah. me, it's always been about my nieces and nephews. It's always been about my nieces and nephews. Um, 
It's the children. It's, it's the I children for me. Your religion and your faith is being used against you. That's yeah. devastating. Yeah. 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 Um, so thank you both. Until next time, everyone. Much love to you all. Thank you. How can you support Get a Life podcast? You can donate internationally via PayPal at www.paypal.me forward slash get a life podcast. PayPal also has a QR code that can be scanned. Or donate to our Get a Life podcast GoFundMe. If you're in a high-demand religious group and need help, please go to oliveleaf.network. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me. Check out www.get-a-life.net for Get A Life merchandise, books, and ways to support or get support. Please remember to like this video, Subscribe to get a life and comment.